You know, brethren, one of the most obvious things that sets God's church apart from others is our observance of the Sabbath day. Uh, This is certainly something that that makes us stand apart. You know, Peter tells us that we're to be a peculiar people. Well, the world thinks we're peculiar uh, for sure because of all things we go to church on Saturday. Instead of going to the lake and going fishing, instead of uh, doing all the kinds of things that uh, they think of as being good to do, we go to church on Saturday. Now, the seventh day Sabbath was given by God as a sign between him and his people. It is something that that ought to make us stand out. A sign is something that identifies. And so we ought to uh, stand out in a right and in a positive way because we observe God's Sabbath. It ought to be something that uh, that maybe the world would notice about us because it is to identify. Now, of course, most people will tell you that it really doesn't matter which day you observe. And this is their way of getting around that. Oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter which day you observe just as long as you observe a day. Now, that's what they say, and they don't really mean that, and, and uh, uh, because it just so happens that the day they all pick is Sunday, see, but they, they, they'll use that kind of a, an argument. And what they mean by observing a day is maybe they go to Sunday school that morning, or maybe they go to church, but then they go home and they do whatever they want to do. Well, they turn on the television and watch the ball game, or maybe they go fishing, or maybe they go here, or maybe they go there, and they figure they have done their part for God when they showed up at church that day. And, of course, you know, you don't want to be fanatic about it and show up every Sabbath, or, I mean, every Sunday. Uh, why, you know, just, uh, if you feel the urge, get up and go. But uh, this is kind of the, the concept that a lot of people, religious people, have about observing a day. Uh, their idea, uh, you know, of observing is just simply to go to church on that day and then do whatever they want to do. Well, brethren... We need to understand and be very deeply conscious of what God has to tell us about observing the Sabbath day, of realizing that, uh, realizing how we should observe God's Sabbath day, that uh, God tells us in the Scripture the way in which we're to keep His Sabbath and the importance that we're to place on it, because certainly God places a lot of importance on it. I'd like to go back through some things this evening and focus in, or this afternoon, and focus in on, on some aspects of the Sabbath commandment that, per, uh, that perhaps we haven't understood or haven't really uh, focused on as, as we should, and because actually when you go through it, there are three different aspects to the Sabbath commandment. Now, there are three different aspects to the Sabbath commandment. We'll, we'll get into that in a little while. But let's notice a little bit in the New Testament to begin with. And understand that we keep the New Testament Sabbath as well as the Old Testament Sabbath. You know, people say, oh, well, you just keep that old Jewish Sabbath. Why, we're a New Testament church. Uh, Back years ago when I was a Baptist, you know, that's what we prided ourselves on. We were a New Testament church. No, we weren't an any Testament church. You know, uh, the the Baptists, uh, they they were doing their own thing. And I, I came to understand that and realize that and had to turn my back on that years ago. And I'm sure many of you, most of you, had to do the same thing. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, we read of Jesus Christ, He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up. And as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. That said, Jesus Christ, as His custom was, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was Jesus Christ's custom. That was his regular pattern of conduct. That's the way he normally lived his life. He went to church on the Sabbath. Now, you know, that, that's something that, uh, uh, that, that was, that was his regular pattern. Now, Jesus Christ, we're told, set us an example that we should follow in his steps. It says that back in, back in Peter. Uh, what is it, First Peter 2.21? He, he suffered for us, setting us an example that we should follow in his steps. Mac and Mark, now, chapter 2, verse 27. Jesus said unto them, speaking here uh, to the Pharisees, he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now notice, Jesus Christ did not say the Sabbath was made for the Jews. He said the Sabbath was made for man. 
And the Sabbath was made when man was made. You go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and 2. God made man on the sixth day. He made the Sabbath right after when the sixth day closed. At sunset, the Sabbath began. God made the Sabbath when he made man. The Sabbath was made for man. And it was made when man was made. The Sabbath was made for man. It was not made against man. It was not a burden. It was not a yoke. It was made for man. So, certainly we need to be uh, conscious of that. We need to understand that as a matter of perspective. That the Sabbath was something that was given uh, for us. It was, it's actually one of the benefits that God has given us. And I, I don't want to go into that aspect of it today. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a whole sermon worth of material on the fact of, of understanding how the Sabbath is a benefit that God gives us. But we see what Christ's example was. We see what Christ's teaching was. He kept the Sabbath. He taught that the Sabbath was made for man. Now let's go on back to the book of Acts. Let's see the way that the apostles lived, the way that the apostle Paul lived. Acts chapter 13, verse 14. We see that Paul, referring here to Paul and the, and, and the group with him, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, You men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Paul stood up, beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you that fear God, give audience. And Paul then began to go on and expound to them God's way of life. Now, this was to the Jews. And some people say, well, yeah, the only reason Paul went to the synagogue on the Sabbath was so he could reach the Jews, because that's where they were. All right, let's go on down a little further. Let's notice down in verse 42. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogues, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And Paul told them that, no, they could come together the next morning at 10 o'clock. And, you know, they didn't have to wait a whole week because they were Gentiles. And Sunday was for the Gentiles and the Sabbath was for the Jews. It doesn't say that, does it? You know... Hope I didn't fake any of you out, didn't upset your faith. No, it doesn't say that. The Gentiles besought that the words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. And Paul didn't tell them anything about, well, why don't you come back tomorrow? We'll get together on the Lord's Day for all you Gentile folks out there. No, he didn't say that. When the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. When the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. You see, the multitude was Gentiles, and Paul was preaching to the Gentiles on the Sabbath, just the same as he did to the Jews, because the Sabbath was the day that he was preaching. See, the Sabbath was God's day. And Paul went on and told uh, you know, the Jews, how that, uh, uh, in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, said it was necessary the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, and he was doing it on the Sabbath. Now this is on, this is on, uh, in the neighborhood of about 14 years. After Jesus Christ had ascended into heaven, after Jesus Christ had been crucified, after everything that had been nailed to the cross had been nailed there. This is over 14 years later. And Paul was still preaching on the Sabbath, and he was preaching to the Gentiles on the Sabbath. I think we need to, we need to realize that. Now I want to note, I want you to notice a scripture in Acts 15, something that really, uh, adds weight and something that maybe we haven't noticed in this context before. Acts chapter 15. Now let me, let me, uh, this is of course the ministerial conference and, and where the decision concerning circumcision was written. Now there are some, there are some and there are some that have gone out from us that have completely twisted and distorted and misunderstood what Acts 15 is talking about. Uh, let's read Acts 15 beginning in verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And that's where they stop. And they close up the Bible and they say, see, that is all that Paul told the Gentiles they had to do. 
That's all the church taught that the Gentiles had to do. All they had to do was abstain from idols, from blood, from fang strangled, and from fornication. Well, now, it doesn't say anything about murder there, does it? You know, <laughs> didn't say that they had to abstain from, and, you know, if you want to be technical about it, and there are whole religions, including a number of those that have gone out from us, Ernest Martin, chief among them, and those that have followed him into uh, his heretical ways, that, uh, you know, they, they turn to this scripture, and that, boy, that's their proof text, that everything is done away, because this is all the Gentiles were commanded to do. Well, if you want to be technical about it, it doesn't say that they can't commit murder. You know, doesn't say anything about uh, about lying. Doesn't say anything about stealing either. Doesn't say anything about honoring your parents. See, the Sabbath is not the only thing that's left out here. In fact, the Sabbath is not left out at all because notice what the next verse says. For Moses of old time, as in every city, them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, I want you to notice something and something that a lot of times we've read over. Why are the only things mentioned here Concerning, I uh, see, it, it talks about circumcision and the fact that that was not binding. And then it went on from that to say that they should abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Why did it enumerate those four and nothing else? Because that was all there was a question about, brethren. They were simply answering the question that had been asked. No one, Jew or Gentile, was so stupid as to ask a question of which day is the Sabbath. They all knew. See, at this time in history, they all knew. That was not an issue. That was not a question. Now, what was a question? Was what constitutes the ceremonial law that is done away? And what is binding? See, where where is the distinction drawn? And when the decision was made that circumcision, physical circumcision of the flesh would not be binding upon Gentiles. Then the church had to go on and clarify that 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 did not mean that everything was done away, that everything was ceremonial. Some of the other things they'd have questions about. Well, you know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, you know, uh, to to, uh, go down to the idol's temple to, to, uh, uh, you know, eat meat offered to idols, does it? See, that's probably just ceremonial too. See, they, they, and there, there were problems, and the problems that had come up, the issues. And these things were so commonly practiced among the Gentiles, they thought nothing of it. And fornication is listed here, and you know, it kind of, we don't put fornication in the same class as, as these other, as, as these other, uh, uh, situations. But I'll tell you, it's something that's hard for us to, to realize. I know I was talking with Mr., Mr. Ed Mars recently, and he was relating to me, some of the experiences Mr. Harold Jackson had encountered in, in Africa. And he mentioned that uh, one of the problems, one of the real problems there in, in Nigeria, where Mr. Jackson, of course, is over the, the uh, work in, in uh, all of, of the black African area, and he was relating to Mr. Mars uh, the fact that, that one of the problems there was that it is against custom, it's against, you know, their practice, their tradition, for couples to get married until the girl is at least three months pregnant. Because they place great emphasis on having, you know, having a large family, so they, uh, fornication is considered nothing. And once, you know, they, they won't marry her if she can't get pregnant. So, uh, you know, they, they commit fornication, and if she's pregnant, well then they go ahead and get married. And you can actually be, be disowned from your family, see, for not doing that, for marrying a girl that's not already pregnant. You know, that's, that's quite a, uh, quite a switch in our thinking. But it was really a problem over there. You know, many of the brethren over there actually faced uh, real severe persecution from their families because they didn't commit fornication. And, uh, you know, it was something Mr. Mars was relating. Uh, this and various other incidents that, that Mr. Jackson had related to him. And I think that it's something that's a little hard for us to, 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 uh, to realize. But you realize this was, this was a common way of thinking in the Gentile world that did not have God's revelation the Bible. And so, the church dealt with these matters and pointed out, no, these things are not ceremonial. They're not uh, matters of little consequence. No, you should not commit fornication. No, you should not entangle yourself with anything connected with idolatry. Things strangled and things uh, that have the blood in them that have not, you know, that's not just some ceremonial thing that's done away. Uh, that, you know, that, that pertains 
They're all a part of God's law. And, and then he goes on, and why didn't they enumerate other things? Why didn't they go on to explain about murder and stealing and all those things? Well, for one thing, there was no question on it. And secondarily, notice, verse 21, For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. The reason they didn't clarify anything else was because nothing else needed to be clarified. The people were going there, even the Gentiles, going into the synagogue every Sabbath day and hearing the law read. They were hearing the first five books. They were hearing the Bible, the law of Moses, as it's called, or as the Jews you know, use the term. Actually, it's the law of God. Moses was simply used by God to give it uh, to Israel. It emanated from God, but the Jews refer to it as, as the books of Moses. And, and, and the laws of Moses. That's why he says Moses has uh, those that preach him. Every week. These Gentiles were going to the synagogue every Sabbath day, and they were hearing the Old Testament Scriptures read. Because that was, the, that was you know, where you, go, you went to hear the Scriptures. They didn't have everybody have a Bible like we have today. So the church said that we don't have to go into more detail and clarify more things. All we need to do is give some general guidelines. Say, concerning the matter of circumcision. But instead of going into detail, those people are going every Sabbath and hearing the law of God read. And since they are doing that, we don't have to enumerate everything else because they hear it week in and week out. I think this is a scripture that many times we've read over and not realized. You know, if those people, uh, if they were doing away with the need to keep God's Sabbath, they would have said so. They would have said, now look, we've got a real problem on our hands. These people are going to the synagogue every Sabbath and they're hearing Moses read. Boy, this is confusing them because they think they ought to keep the law. What we need to do is instruct these Gentiles to quit going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and, and, uh, you know, just get together on Sunday morning and hear the law done away with rather than hear it read. I mean, you know, uh, that would have been a Baptist solution to the problem. You know, the point is it wasn't a problem. That was not, you know, that had no no, uh, problem one way or the other. But they were going on the Sabbath. I think it's, it's good for us to focus in on that and to realize that not only did Christ keep the Sabbath, not only did he teach the Sabbath, so did Paul and all of the New Testament apostles. Now, with that as a background and understanding and realizing that the Sabbath certainly is in full force and effect today, let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 and focus in on the Sabbath commandment itself and understand certain aspects of this commandment that perhaps we have not focused as clearly on as, as maybe we should have. At least, you know, some of you uh, who are newer maybe are not, uh, have not heard some of these things. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the eternal your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the eternal made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the eternal blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here God gives the Sabbath commandment. Now let's notice the first aspect of the commandment. The first thing we're told to do is remember the Sabbath day. That's the first aspect of the the Sabbath commandment. Now, that doesn't mean that you're sitting out, you know, uh, casting your fly rod uh, out in the middle of the lake, you know, sitting in your boat, and all of a sudden, hey, I remember it's the Sabbath. How about that? Well, you know, keep, keep going. That's not what it's talking about when it says remember the Sabbath day, that you're out just kind of doing whatever you're doing, and all of a sudden it dawns on you, hey, it's the Sabbath. And you keep, you know, going on about what you're doing. Let's go back to Psalms. Psalms 92. What do you, what should you remember? You know, what does it mean, remember the Sabbath day? Is God just simply saying, don't let it slip your minds? You know, make sure you, uh, you, you circle the date on the calendar so that, uh, uh, you know, you don't happen to think it's Tuesday or something and, and, uh, skip out. Well, you know, perhaps that's a part of it, but that's, that's not really the emphasis. Notice Psalm 92. Now, if you'll notice printed under Psalm 92 in your Bibles, it says, A psalm or song for the Sabbath day. That's printed there right above verse 1 and right under Psalm 92. That is a part of the original text. This is specifically a psalm for the Sabbath day. 
And the reason it is a psalm for the Sabbath day is because it points out what we are to remember. It points out what we are to remember. The Jews had traditionally seven psalms that were the seven Sabbath psalms. The Levitical choir on the, at the temple sung these seven psalms every Friday evening. These were the seven Sabbath psalms. This one was the Sabbath, the Sabbath psalm in particular. There were six others that were also used in the liturgy and are used to this day in Orthodox Jewish synagogues. Now, let's go through Psalm 92. Let's understand why it specifically is labeled and even was labeled in the original text a psalm for the Sabbath day. Beginning in verse 1. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Eternal and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings, upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For you, Eternal, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the work of your hands. O Eternal, how great are your works and your thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knows not, neither does a fool understand this, when the wicked springs as the grass, when all the workers of iniquity do flourish. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. Now notice what he said here. A brutish man does not understand. He doesn't know this. A fool doesn't understand this. He looks around and sees the wicked springing up like the grass. You know, kind of like crab grass in your garden or something. It's all over the place. All the workers of iniquity do flourish. You look around, that's what you see. A foolish person does not understand when he sees that, that they shall all be destroyed forever. You look around and wickedness multiplies, well, how do you know that it's it's going to be destroyed forever? Well, we're going to see that a little later. But you, eternal, are most high forevermore. For lo, your enemies, O eternal, for lo, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall you exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. My eyes also shall see my desire on my enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, shall grow up like a cedar in Lebanon. Those shall be planted in the house of the eternal, shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the eternal is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, if you will notice, in Psalm 92, there are two things that are focused on. And they are the two things that we are to remember in conjunction with the Sabbath day, that the Sabbath reminds us of. The Sabbath reminds us that God is the Creator. This is focused on in the earlier part of the chapter. Uh, You have made, verse 4, you have made me glad through your work. Verse 5, O Lord, how great are your works. See, you go back to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. The Sabbath reminds us that God is the Creator. It reminds us that we didn't get here, that the creation around us did not get here by accident, by evolution. You cannot be a Sabbath keeper and an evolutionist both. You see, it contradicts. It absolutely, totally contradicts because the Sabbath reminds us that God is the Creator. And every time the Sabbath comes around, it reminds us that, it reminds us of that. We're to remember that, that God is God, that He is the Creator, the Giver of every good thing. Now, what also are we to remember? The Sabbath is a memorial of creation, and it also is a type of the world to come, the world tomorrow. The Sabbath is a day of rest. Now, what is going to be the situation in the millennium? What is the world going to do, what what, what are we told is going to transpire when 
verse uh, Isaiah 14, verse 7, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. You know, God used a pattern of seven. You had the sabbatical year. You know, six years uh, where you, you did your agricultural work and you tilled the land the seventh year, the sabbatical year, the land was, was given rest. All right, the seventh millennium, the seventh 1,000 year period, the millennium, the whole earth is at rest. You know, it's got a rest from sin and from the results of sin. So the Sabbath reminds us, we're, we're told, you know, of entering into God's rest, and that's gone into back in Hebrews 3 and 4. I won't turn there now at this time, uh, but we can go through that at a later time. So, the Sabbath reminds us of the world to come. It reminds us that God created the heavens and the earth, and it reminds us that God is going to intervene. It reminds us of the time... That even though we look around us in the world today, and the wicked flourish is grass, you know, look like my garden. Uh, after all the rain, grass all over the place. Maybe look like yours too. Seems to be the thing that grows best, you know. Uh, can't grow it in my yard where I want to, but the garden, it grows real well. And uh, anyway, the wicked flourishes the grass. The iniquity flourishes. But, The Sabbath reminds us that that is only temporary. The time is going to come that God has reserved to Himself. And though you look around and you see all kinds of things going on, you can know and know that you know that those things are going to come to an end. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder of hope. You know, you get discouraged, things are going wrong, you you have problems, Uh, the, the, the world around... Uh, You kind of get down. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder of hope. When we're told to remember the Sabbath day, we're to focus in, when the Sabbath comes, on God and who God is and how great He is and how mighty and how powerful that He is the Creator. And that God has not just ceased His action and His interest in human affairs, but Jesus Christ is going to return and establish the government of God. We're to remember that. The Sabbath reminds us. So it goes on in verse 10, talks about my horn. You know, a horn is used as a type of a, of a kingdom. You remember the ten horns of Revelation uh, chapter 13, uh, of Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 17, the ten horns represent ten kings. Okay, a horn represents a king or a kingdom. My horn shall you exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Now what does that mean? Well, you know, you've seen a picture of a unicorn. A unicorn has one horn. You know, it sticks way out. It's not like the antlers of a deer, where he's got all kind of horns. You see, it's not going to be like today's society where there are all kinds of governments. There's going to be the government of God, and it's going to be exalted. It's going to be like the horn of a unicorn, nothing else around. See, just that one government, way up above everything else. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Uh, And, of course, the word Messiah means the anointed one. Christ is the Greek form, Messiah is the Hebrew form, and they both mean the anointed one. My eyes shall see my desire on my enemies. Verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He'll grow up like a cedar in Lebanon, you know, great and, and majestic. You know, the, 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 the wicked flourish like the grass. They grow up quickly, but they're going to be destroyed in the same way. The righteous flourishes with a, with a permanence and a stability that is compared here to like a cedar of Lebanon. They'll be planted in the house of the eternal. They will flourish in the courts of our God. So the Sabbath reminds us of this. It reminds us that the righteous will triumph, that God will intervene, that God's government will be established once again on this earth. It reminds us that God is the Creator. So when God tells us the beginning of the Sabbath commandment, let's let's notice a couple of of things uh, well, we've already noticed one of them in Isaiah uh, chapter 14 and verse 7, that the whole earth will be at rest. Uh, and, well, I, I think that's uh, that's sufficient. But uh, uh, 
The Sabbath is a reminder of the world to come. So when we're told in in Exodus chapter 20 to remember the Sabbath day, there are things that we are to remember. The Sabbath reminds us of certain things. Deeply conscious of the meaning that the Sabbath conveys. That's, That's one aspect of the commandment. Now let's go on. The next aspect of the commandment is given in Exodus 20, verse 8. The latter part of the verse. The first part is remember the Sabbath day. Next, we're told to keep it holy. See, you're not only to be deeply conscious of what the Sabbath means, but you're also to keep the Sabbath holy. Now, you cannot keep cold water hot. I think you have probably heard that analogy before. I think you realize it. You cannot keep cold water hot. You can make it hot and then keep it that way, but to keep something means that you maintain it in the state where it is. So you you can keep the Sabbath holy only because it is holy. You cannot keep Sunday holy. I don't care what you do. You can't keep it holy because it's not holy. You can't make it holy, and you certainly can't keep it that way because it's not. All right, let's go back to Exodus chapter 31. The Sabbath, which we're told to keep holy, is a sign. And it is a sign of God's holy people. God has called us out of the world to be a holy people. We are made holy because we are partakers of God's Holy Spirit. You know what makes you a... a, God, God? The word saint means holy ones. That's what the word saint means, holy ones. You know, people say, well, I'm no saint. Well, if you're no saint, you won't be in the kingdom because there won't be anybody in the kingdom but saints. See, the saints shall inherit the kingdom of the Most High. So, uh, if you don't want to be a saint, well then, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, there are only two classifications. you got saints and sinners. And uh, saints inherit the kingdom and sinners burn up. So, you know, play, you know, take your choice, which, which category you want to be in. Now, the word saint means holy one. Now, how do you get to be holy? Well, holiness is a characteristic God possesses. God is holy. And where God places his presence is holy. Now, you remember, go back to the, go back to the example in Exodus. You remember when, when Moses saw the burning bush? And God, what did God tell him? He said, Moses, take your shoes off. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Now, why was it a holy ground? Well, because God's presence was there. Where God placed His presence was holy. Because God is holy. You can go to other examples. You remember when God was going to give the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. And what did, what, what did God tell Moses? He told him, He said, You set a fence around the mountain. Don't let the people come near to it. Don't let them touch it lest they die. Because God's presence was there. It was not to be lightly esteemed. It was made holy because God was there. Now, Israel of old was called to be a holy people. They were a holy people because God dwelled among them. We are a holy people because God dwells in us. The difference between the Old Testament church and the New Testament church is God only dwelt among them. If you go back and you look at the pattern of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the tabernacle was in the middle of the camp. And all of the people, three tribes on each side, were camped around it. The tabernacle was in the middle. God was among them. God says of us that He will be in us through the power of His Holy Spirit. God placed His holy presence there. And the tabernacle was holy. And the holy place, and the holy of holies. And you know, the priests, before they could enter in, to the temple or to the tabernacle, they had to wash themselves and put on clean garments. In other words, to approach God, who is holy, you have to be clean. You know, we're we're baptized. We, We have to be cleansed, you know, for God to dwell in us through His Holy Spirit. That's what baptism symbolizes, you know, a washing away of our sins. We have to be clean for God to place His holy presence in us. You go back, you know, and all the the... Regulations given in Leviticus. Leviticus is a book that is given to tell people how to be holy. 
and to, to point out the importance of holiness. Now, the Sabbath was a holy day, and that was the sign between the holy God and his holy people. It was a sign that was to, it, it, it pointed out who God is, and it pointed out who his people are. Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, Speak you also unto the children of Israel, saying, Truly, my Sabbaths you shall keep, my Sabbaths plural. You shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the eternal that does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. That's how seriously God took it. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done. The seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the eternal. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. In six days the Eternal made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath is a sign of God's holy people. It's a sign. Now, back in Leviticus chapter 23, we notice something about the Sabbath. Verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Eternal, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the eternal in all your dwellings. Then it goes on and it enumerates the annual Sabbaths. We're going to be coming up to one of those very shortly, the day of Pentecost, which is on Sunday, June the 3rd. You know, I hope we're deeply conscious of that and are aware of that. Mr. Armstrong has a very fine article on it. And this new good news. I hope you'll read that and study it prior to the holy day itself. But uh, I don't want to go through and enumerate all of the holy days. That's not the main purpose of the sermon this, this afternoon. But notice here what it says about the Sabbath, a part of keeping the Sabbath holy. See, we're told, so we're focusing in on the second aspect of the Sabbath commandment, to keep it holy. Now, the Sabbath, we're told, is a holy convocation. I wonder if we understand how strong a word the word convocation is. Did you see the Houston Post this morning? Thirteen members of the state senate that, that uh, there's a warrant out for their arrest. You see that? The, the, the state, the Texas Rangers, the state police, you know, the, uh, the whole works. They're out combing the state of Texas for these guys. Do you know why they can do that? Now, I want you to realize, the word convene is a word we don't normally use. A court convenes. A legislature convenes. The Congress convenes. The word convene means to assemble by authority. That's what the word means. Now, when the governor convokes a session of the legislature, there is an order issued, and the legislators are required to appear. Now, when the court convenes, everyone the judge is ordered to appear it better be there. If not, they get, you know, they're, they're in contempt of court, and, and a warrant is issued for their arrest. You know, that, that's, that's the way it is. Now, these legislators, of course, if you read the story of politics, and they're trying to, they're trying to dump a bill, and so they, they were keeping a, a quorum from being established, and they were, uh, they were dodging. They weren't showing up and kept the legislature from meeting. But that is illegal. You know, a legislator is subject to arrest if he does not show up when the legislature convenes. And, and you know, if the Texas Rangers catch him, they can handcuff him and, and drag him there and stick him down in his seat. You know, that's, that's, that's the law. And you have to receive a, an excused absence. And it referred, there's one fellow that, that evidently had an excused absence, uh, but the rest of them were playing hooky. And that was illegal. Now, I bring that in to illustrate what the word convene means. The word convene is a strong word. It does not mean a suggested place to be if you can't think of anything else you'd rather be doing. For a legislator to, to skip the session and to go fishing instead, 
He's subject to arrest. It's illegal. Now, I'm not saying that none of them have ever done it, but I'm saying they're subject to arrest. And if they want to enforce the law, they can send out the, the Texas Rangers or the state patrol, and they can, you know, drag them there. It's illegal. Now, that is the word God uses when he talks about the Sabbath. He said it is a holy convocation. It is a convoking together. It is an assembly under authority. It's not just a suggested place to be if you can't think of anything else you'd rather be doing. It is illegal, according to the law of God, for you to play hooky. You know, (laughs) to be real, that's what it says. See, it's illegal to play hooky. Now, you know, if there, there are, there are maybe legitimate reasons, maybe because of sickness, or a genuine emergency, why a person uh, would, would be unable to attend a Sabbath service, and certainly God understands that. But God looks on the heart, and God knows, that it, you know, God knows the difference between playing hooky and a genuine uh, reason why a person is unable to attend. But it's a matter of the kind of priority. You know, sometimes people who skip out on Sabbath services wouldn't think of skipping their job. You know, they, they, they don't feel the urge to go that morning or that afternoon. But, uh, well, you know, if the only places you ever go are the places you just kind of feel an urge to go, I'll tell you, sometimes I don't feel like getting up and going a lot of places I go, and I don't imagine you do either. You know, the alarm clock goes off early in the morning, and where, where you really feel like going is going back to sleep. You don't have to worry about that on the Sabbath. You know, I do. I, I, I get to get up early on the Sabbath. You get to sleep in. But uh, the... Uh, the point that I want to emphasize is that a part of the Sabbath commandment is that it is a holy convocation. So really, it's far more important than any convoking that man does. It is a holy convocation. It is a commanded assembly made holy by God. The Sabbath and all of the annual Sabbaths are commanded assemblies made holy by God. So that is a part of keeping the Sabbath holy. It's very important to understand that. I think we've, we've kind of drifted, and, and at least uh, some have in God's church, and haven't placed the importance on attending the Sabbath service uh, that uh, perhaps we have, we have put in times past. We need to understand, you know, if, if any of that kind of watered-down approach has gotten into your mind, you need to repent of it and get rid of it. Because that's not God's approach. See, that's not God's approach. And you're breaking the Sabbath day if, if uh, you don't have a valid reason uh, not to be here. You just don't, you know, happen to, to, to feel the urge. Uh, you've broken the Sabbath. You, you have not kept it holy. Now, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32 says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even unto even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Uh, this tells us, this is specific, is speak, speaking specifically of the Day of Atonement, but it tells us here regarding the time that belongs to God, the time that is holy time, from sunset to sunset, from evening to evening. Evening begins at sunset. You know, that's the way God marks time. From sunset to sunset is holy time. It's time that does not belong to you and it does not belong to me. It belongs to God. It's holy time. And uh, we're, that is the time that we're to keep holy. We need to understand that and to realize that. And sometimes there have been, you know, uh, some that have uh, taken kind of a a watered-down approach to that. And, uh, uh, you know, God tells us that from evening to evening, from sunset to sunset, that belongs to Him. That's holy time. All right. Isaiah chapter 56 illustrates the importance that God places on the Sabbath and the fact that it is a sign of God's holy covenant. Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 1, Thus says the Eternal, Keep you judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the eternal speak, saying, The eternal has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the eternal unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, 
and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to me, to the eternal, to serve him, to love the name of the eternal, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. So God here talks about that we're to keep the Sabbath holy, that that the, that the Sabbath, we're to keep the Sabbath from polluting it. So we're to be very conscious of the way that we keep the Sabbath. We're not to pollute the Sabbath, that realizing that's holy time, that's time that belongs to God. We're to assemble before Him in holy convocation. We are to use the Sabbath as a time for extra prayer and for extra Bible study. It's a time to draw close to God in a special way. So we're to remember the Sabbath and we're to keep it holy. That's, those are two aspects of the commandment. Now let's go back to Exodus 20 and focus once again on the third aspect of the commandment, the one that we most commonly think of, beginning in verse 9. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the eternal your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, or your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your cattle, your, the stranger within your gates. So God says that you and everything and everyone that is under your authority, is to refrain from work on the Sabbath day. Everything that is under your authority might not remember the Sabbath, and they might not keep it holy, but they, they're to refrain from work. You know, it says even your cattle, the stranger that's within your gate. Uh, somebody comes along, and you know, a stranger, and you let him spend the night with you, uh, you know, don't, don't send him out to... Uh, you know, to mow your yard the next morning so that, uh, say, well, you know, I'll let you, uh, uh, you know, you don't keep the Sabbath and I do, so I'll let you go out and paint my house and mow my yard, uh, today and I'll go to church. No, you know, the stranger that is within your gate. You know, it, it says your cattle. Back then, of course, they would plow with oxen and things like that. You weren't even to let your neighbor borrow your ox and make your ox get out and plow on the Sabbath day. You know, everything that was under your authority was to rest on the Sabbath day. You were not to force anything under your authority uh, to, to get out and to work. Your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, you know, whoever. And that's not talking about a, a situation. We, we've got circumstances today where maybe you work, and, uh, you work for a company. Maybe you're a foreman or maybe you're, uh, you know, a superintendent or something. And, uh, you know, maybe the company says people here work on the Sabbath. Well, you, if you're going to obey God, you're not going to go in. What about the people on your crew? You don't have the authority not to tell them to go in, you see. If you own the company, God will hold you responsible. If you don't, if you simply work there, the only one you have authority not to, to go in, you know, not to, to, to have not to work on the Sabbath is yourself. See, it's a matter of what you actually have authority over. God holds you responsible for what you have authority over. You, he holds you responsible for what goes on in your household. You're the head of that household. If you're the head of that household, God holds you responsible for what goes on. And, and uh, you, you know, you're to, you're to see that uh, God's standards uh, do go on and they're not compromised. So we're told that the Sabbath is a day of rest. Now this is the only aspect sometimes that people focus on. But I'll tell you what, you know, you could sleep, you could sleep the Sabbath through. You could go to sleep Friday sunset and wake up sun, Saturday sunset and you would have rested. The ultimate and rested. But you would have broken the Sabbath. Because you wouldn't have remembered it and you wouldn't have kept it whole. So two thirds of the Sabbath commandment you would have broken. You see? There, there's more aspect to the Sabbath than just resting. That's part of it. We're told that we're to work six days. So we are told to work and to be industrious. And we're also told then to rest on the seventh day. Now let's notice some of the things God tells us in this regard. Notice back in the book of, of Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 verse 21. Thus says the eternal, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. 
Neither carry forth the burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do you any work, but hallow you the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. Now, this, what does it mean, burden? Well, I, if you look this up in the Sonsino, which is the Jewish commentary, uh, they bring out very clearly what the word burden means. Uh, the word burden in verse 21 means uh, burden of merchandise, or more particularly, uh, things from agricultural districts. This is what it's talking about, bringing in your produce into the city of Jerusalem uh, on the Sabbath. Or the burden out of, carrying forth the burden out of your houses, verse 22. You know, it's not talking about carrying your Bible in your notebook. You shouldn't carry a burden, you know. i got my baby blankets and my, uh, my diaper bag and my Bible and my notebook. It's not supposed to carry a burden on the Sabbath. Well, uh, you know, leave, leave your Bible behind. It's a big one. It's too much of a burden. Uh, no, that's not what it's talking about, you know. And uh, Some of you perhaps have thought that. Uh, I kind of wondered... Uh, if some of our teenagers thought that, a few of them seem to bring a Bible on the Sabbath, you know, that's not what it's talking about. That's not the burden you're not to bear, so you can feel, you can rest easy on that point. Some of you have been concerned about it. I doubt that you had been, but, uh, you know, that's a burden you ought to bear on the Sabbath. It certainly is preferable to Mad Magazine or Sports Illustrated or some of these other things that should not be uh, your, you know, reading material during the sermon. Okay, it says, neither carry forth a burden, in other words, articles brought from the house with which to barter or trade for produce. That's what it's talking about. You know, you're not to engage in commerce. You're, you're not to be in, engaged in business on the Sabbath day. It goes on through, and it talks about uh, the fact of uh, that God talks about the punishment that's going to come on this nation because... Uh, they refuse to hearken to God's commandment and to keep the Sabbath. They engage in all of their work and all of their commerce and industry on the Sabbath. Now notice Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the eternal, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Eternal has spoken it. Now what is this talking about? If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure. Now some have tried to say, oh, this is only talking about doing your business. Well, the word that's used here for pleasure goes far beyond that. You know, some have tried to, in their own imagination, their own human carnal reasonings, say, well, all it's saying here is, is don't go out and work at your trade, but there's nothing wrong with going to the ball game or going to the movies or, uh, you know, going out and uh, spending a day on the beach. Uh, you're not working. Well, that's not what it says. It says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day. And the word simply means, that's what it means. It means your own activities. It means doing your own thing. If you want to translate it, you know, in, in, in the most broad sense, it includes pleasure. It's the word hyphens, and, it, and it's translated even in Hebrew today as pleasure. It means other things too. It means the whole scope of doing your own activities, doing your own thing. The Sabbath is not your day to do your thing. That's what it's saying. See? It's not the day for your own sports and recreation. It's not the day for your entertainment, for your fishing and hunting trips. You know, it's not the day to sit up and, uh, you know, uh, watch the, watch television all day and go to the movies and all this kind of thing. You're not, uh, you're not observing the Sabbath. I, does that mean that if you turn on the news, uh, you know, on Friday evening that you've broken the Sabbath, well, no, that's not, that's not the point. We're talking about, uh, there's a difference between turning on the news to find out what's going on, or sometimes, uh, perhaps some very special program, some areas of the country, our own television program is on on the Sabbath. You know, there's, not, there's nothing magical about the television knob. What it's talking about is entertaining yourself on the Sabbath. You know, to sit up and watch the Saturday morning cartoons or the Saturday afternoon ball game, you know, to watch the Super Bowl. You're not keeping the Sabbath holy. You're, you know, you're doing your own pleasure. You're doing your own thing. You know, you, there's no way in the world you go out and, and, and go to the ball game in the morning and go to the movies that afternoon. You might not have worked, but you've sure broken the Sabbath. 
You've not kept it holy. You haven't refrained from, from doing your own thing. And that's what God says here in, in Isaiah 58. You turn away your foot from the Sabbath. Don't stomp all over my holy day. That's what he said. You know, just like he told Moses, take your shoes off. The ground is holy ground. Don't go stomping around all over it, Moses. God says here, take your foot off my Sabbath day. Don't wipe your feet on it. Don't do your own pleasure. Don't do your own thing. Don't do your own activity on the Sabbath. That's not your day. It's my day. You call it a delight, the holy of the eternal, honorable. You shall honor Him. Not doing your own ways. Not not doing your own thing. Not preoccupied with you and your activities and all your pleasures and entertainments and pursuits. But it's a day to have your mind on God. Even in the conversation that we engage in. Now, does this mean that, uh, that that you ought to sit in the corner with your nose in the Bible from sun, sunset to sunrise, and then from sunrise to sunset? No, that's not what it's talking about. But it is talking about, you know, there, there, there are many right and good and positive things on the Sabbath. Sabbath is certainly a day uh, for the family to uh, spend time together and to, and, and to talk and to... Uh, it's a time certainly for parents to, to teach their children and to be together as a family. But I'll tell you what, if you do the things that God tells you to do on the Sabbath, and if you devote extra time to that, you know, if, if, if uh, you have a restful, relaxed meal Friday, uh, Friday evening and the family uh, sits around and talks over the week and, and the things that have transpired and, and uh, you know, you... Uh, Perhaps if you have family Bible study that evening, you go to bed and get a good night's sleep, maybe sleep in a little bit that morning, uh, get up and get in some extra prayer and extra Bible study and have a leisurely brunch and, uh, you know, spend a little time uh, again uh, extra, maybe, talking with your wife and with your children, spending a little time with them, instructing your children in God's way, talking things over, maybe... Uh, have a chance to catch up on some articles and the good news and the, and the worldwide news, the plain truth you've gotten behind on. You know, you, you get ready and get to church and you try to get here early so you have time to fellowship. And you're here for the sermon and you stay around and you fellowship afterward. You really don't have a whole lot of other time on the Sabbath, do you? See, that pretty well takes up your whole Sabbath. You don't have to worry about this, this huge a block of time that you don't have anything to do in. See, and it doesn't mean you're just sitting in, in, in a corner with your nose in the Bible from sun, sunset to sunset. That's not what it's talking about, but it is talking about the fact that it's God's time and we ought to be conscious of it. We ought to be aware of it. And we ought to have our mind primarily on God and His way and His work and the things pertaining to that and not just on our own uh, recreation or entertainment or doing our particular thing, whatever it is. Nehemiah chapter 13 uh, emphasizes the work aspect of it. Nehemiah had a problem. Notice Nehemiah 13, verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this you do, and profane the Sabbath day? Nehemiah got a little bit upset about it. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants said I at the gate that there should be no burden brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. You know, applying human nature. Well, if he doesn't want us inside Jerusalem selling on the Sabbath, we'll pitch our tent right outside the gate and we'll sell right out there on the Sabbath. Verse 21, Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why well, I lodge you about the wall. You know, didn't you fellows get the point the first time around? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Nehemiah was not proposing to ordain any of them. 
you know, in case you wondered. That's not what he meant when he said, you know, if you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Nobody was going to be ordained, but they were going to have hands laid on them. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. See, they got the point. They understood. Nehemiah was not going to put up with it. He was the civil governor of Judah at that time, and he had that within the, the scope of the civil authority. Certainly, we don't have the authority to go out and shut down all the stores on the Sabbath. But I'll guarantee you the time's going to come when we will, and when it will be done. And God is not going to allow that. One of the main reasons this nation is going into captivity is because of Sabbath breaking. You know, Israel of old went into the captivity because of two major sins, idolatry and Sabbath breaking. And, you know, we maybe take them lightly. Don't think it's any big thing. You go through and you read what God said about it. And what he said happened to Judah and happened to Israel because of idolatry and Sabbath break. Brethren, we need to understand that and be very deeply conscious of the fact that we are to rest on the Sabbath day. We are to remember the Sabbath day, we are to keep it holy, and we are to rest. It's not a day that we are to do our own work and we are not to to, uh, hire others to uh, work for us on that day. Now, we need to be deeply conscious of the Sabbath to refrain from polluting it. We need to make it special. It needs to be something. There, there are many uh, things that you can do that can highlight the Sabbath. Make it a delight in the right way, in accordance with God's law. You know, so many times in our society during the week, husbands and wives and children uh, sitting around the family dinner table and... Uh, uh, having a meaningful discussion and spending some time together and having a nice, leisurely, enjoyable meal. That's something that is kind of a, t- a thing of the past in, in so many families. Because various activities and various things and everybody's going, going, going. You know, as the Sabbath comes on, that's a time when when there can be that. When you can have an enjoyable Friday evening. I, I think particularly that's always uh, been the uh, portion of the Sabbath that, that we primarily have been able to enjoy together as as a family. And uh, it's always been our custom uh, to have uh, a relaxed meal, an enjoyable meal, uh, a special meal, and uh, uh, to all, you know, sit together and and, uh, uh, to have a chance to to talk and to visit with the children. I I wind up on the road a lot of the times during the week, and and, uh, many of the meals I don't get to eat with my family. Many of you are in similar circumstances, but there's no excuse for that as a normal course of action on Friday, uh, on Friday evening. And so it's, it, it, it really, uh, you know, starts the Sabbath off in a special way. The Jews have, have traditionally had a custom on this. And I'll tell you something, the Jews traditionally have close families too. And they use that time and they accent the family at that particular time. The Sabbath can be made a delight for children. I'll tell you, the way the parents approach the Sabbath, the, the attitude the parents have toward the Sabbath and toward attending the church, toward attending services on the Sabbath, uh, it shows up in the children. To a very great degree. You know, don't say, well, you know, little, little kids, boy, there's no way that they, they, they'll ever look forward to the Sabbath. I want to tell you something, my, my kids have gone to church more on the Sabbath, I, I dare say, than, than probably any of your kids, because they've made the circuit with me ever since uh, they were three weeks old. See, and they, I don't think with more than half a dozen exceptions, uh, they, they, they've hit it twice, every Sabbath. And they don't, they don't, they, they, other than about the four weeks we had off up here when we first came to Houston, uh, they don't know what it is not, not to go twice on the Sabbath, because we've always been in an area where I had a Sabbath circuit, and we'd go to church in the morning and go to church in the afternoon, and they don't dread that. I, I can remember a couple of times in Corpus, when David, uh, the, the youngest one, was sick, uh, had something, you know, wasn't of major nature, but uh, uh, he was not feeling well and my wife was not feeling well. And so they skipped the morning service and, and by afternoon they were feeling better, but uh, uh, they went on to, to Corpus uh, in the afternoon. But they didn't make the valley circuit or the Victoria circuit with me in the morning. And I remember the first time that happened and got up and, and I said, well, I'll just go by myself. You're not feeling well, so you and the kids stay, stay here and rest. And uh, I was just about ready to go, and Charles got up. And, uh, you know, he uh, uh, immediately started grabbing his stuff up, and he was, you know, he was ready to get in. I said, well, you know, I I was going to let y'all stay behind. Well, no, he didn't want to stay behind. He wanted to go with Daddy. 
And uh, he, you know, he enjoyed that. And David got up after then, and he saw us ready to go, and he was ready to start crying because he wasn't going to get to go. You know, he thought he was going to miss all the fun. Because they, they've never heard my wife or I complain about the Sabbath. I don't complain about a Sabbath circuit. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm thankful to have it as long as, as uh, God wants me to have it. I'll, I'll enjoy it and uh, make the best of it. We can use the time in the car, and we can talk, and we can uh, uh, visit with them. And uh, we can, uh, you know, play Bible memory games and things like that, even driving up to Lufkin. And uh, there are a lot of things, and, and, and they, we can, uh, you know, we can spend time in conversation that perhaps we wouldn't spend otherwise. I'll tell you, you can take something and you can put a positive light on it, and if you approach it in a positive way and make it a positive thing and teach your children in a positive way about it, they'll look at it in a positive way. They will absorb your attitude. And if you do it begrudgingly and, oh, you know, I'm going to have to go to church again, I'll tell you what, they're going to, they're going to have that attitude and that's the way they're going to look at it. They're going to absorb your attitude and your, and your aspect and, and your approach to it. Uh, we need to be very conscious of what we teach our children. And, and I think we need to be more diligent about teaching them on the Sabbath and certainly the conduct of some of the children on the Sabbath day. Uh, our children need to understand. God's law, and we need to certainly to have, and I just wonder, you know, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by asking, but I just wonder how many of you have family Bible study, how many of you uh, take time on Friday evenings or on Sabbath morning to teach your children God's way. Too many parents have thought, well, let the church do it, you know, the church will come up with some program, let the church get some program, and they, the church needs to keep teach my kids. No. God does not hold the church responsible for teaching your children. Let me emphasize that again, that God does not hold the church responsible for teaching your children God's way. God holds you, the parents, responsible for teaching your children God's way. God says in Exodus chapter, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the eternal, your God, commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. That you might fear the eternal your God to keep all his statutes, his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your son's son, all the days of your life. You and your family. Now go on down. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the eternal your God is one Lord. You shall love the eternal your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children. You shall teach them diligently unto your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. It ought to be a topic of conversation. It ought to be on your mind. It ought to be something you instruct your children in. God holds you responsible for teaching your children His way of life. We need to teach our children to keep the Sabbath. Now, obviously, they're not going to keep the Sabbath and the Spirit and the intent in the same way that God expects us as converted adults to do. But they can begin to learn. They can begin to learn from the time that they're, they're old enough to say the words that sunset on Friday begins the Sabbath. I, I can remember taking our children out when they were just, you know, we were holding them in our arms. And they were just learning to talk. And we'd walk out and I'd point out the sunset. And it was beautiful. And we'd, we'd stand outside there in Corpus uh, or in Paducah, Kentucky when Charles was small. And I'd point out the sunset. And I'd tell him, you know, that, that when the sun set on Friday, it was God's time. And we'd talk about God and how God is the one that made everything around. Well, you know, his, his, their, their understanding and their comprehension of those things grows. And they don't understand everything you say at first. What are you going to do? Wait till they're 15 and then sit down and start teaching them? If you do, you've waited too late. You start teaching them from the very earliest that they can even begin to comprehend language. And it grows on them and they gradually absorb it and they learn it and it becomes a part of them. And they just, you know, they understand it. And they grow up understanding it. They can't even remember the first time they heard it because they've always heard it. And they've been taught it and it's been drilled into them. And the older they get, on the, the greater depth and the greater level you teach it. You don't teach a teenager the way you teach a, a preschooler. But you, you build on that. But you start out when they're young. And, and the early years are very vital. When children get old enough, you know, when they're school age and they're, they're, they're up and they're sitting, uh, they're sitting uh, up and, and listening in class, supposedly that's what they're doing at school, they're old enough to start sitting up and listening in Sabbath services. 
you know, and, and, and you can you can even discuss uh, the sermons after uh, after church, maybe on your way home after Sabbath services. Uh, that helps you to remember. You might be surprised if you tell your children ahead of time, say, I want you to listen to the sermon and see what you get out of it. I've been very surprised some of the things my children have gotten, uh, particularly in Lufkin. Normally they, uh, they, they, they're awake in Lufkin. They, they, since they're, uh, both preschoolers and have been accustomed to taking naps, uh, they've usually, uh, slept on, uh, in, in the afternoon. But, uh, uh, you know, as they get older, that they, uh, where they're in school and where they're accustomed to, uh, uh, to sitting up. But I, I've been very surprised sometimes some of the things that uh, uh, they picked up when I would ask them, well, well did, you, did you hear anything that Daddy said today in the sermon? And uh, you, know, you might be surprised, too, at how even a young child can pick up things. And they don't, they don't understand it all. You know, frankly, the adults don't uh, manage to get it all either. I've, uh, as I've learned sometimes, I've been rather surprised what people think I've spoke on, uh, spoken on. I happened to, somebody left their notes behind you know, from time to time, you see that and you pick it up just out of curiosity. You want to see what they say you said. And sometimes I wouldn't have recognized the sermon, you know. did I, I didn't I don't think I heard that one. Uh, it had my name at the top. Supposedly it was what I gave. So uh, everybody doesn't always get the same thing. But the point is we need to teach our children. You know, when your children are old enough to read, you ought to get a Bible for them. You ought to begin to teach them. You ought to begin to, to go over and to try to make these things positive and interesting and, and, and to build. You know, God's way of life is a family way of life, and we need to emphasize the family. And not just fragment and go every which way, but our activities primarily ought to be family-centered. And uh, our, certainly we ought to put a lot of emphasis on the family. God does, and the Sabbath is a time to emphasize a lot of that. And we need to teach our children. We need to teach them in terms of their conduct at Sabbath services. Uh, they should not just be running helter-skelter, going every which way. God says, back in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30, You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Eternal. Now, you know, where we meet, wherever that is, that's the place God has placed His name for His church to meet. And while we're meeting at Hambrick Junior High School, and this is where God has placed His name for the North Houston Church to meet. And a part of keeping the Sabbath is to reverence the sanctuary. You teach children, you know, it's not uh, don't go out running helter-skelter all over the place. Teach them to have regard. I'll guarantee you, you know, even when I was a Baptist in Baptist church, and a lot of you, you came up maybe in the Baptist or the Methodist or whatever. You know, even some of them teach their children you don't go running helter-skelter all over all over the sanctuary, some of them give higher regard and, 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 and uh, even some of their children have, high, have greater reverence for a place that is not even God's house, but they think it is, but some of our children do for where the eternal God has placed His name. You know, and that, that's to our shame, brethren. That should not be. We need to set an example. And we need to be deeply conscious of our example. We need to be deeply conscious of teaching our children on God's Sabbath, making it a delight to them. Using it as a time when you do spend a little extra time, you listen to them, you talk with them, you instruct them, you encourage them. You certainly need to use it as a time to draw close to God. We need to, we need to realize that, that the Sabbath God gives us as a sign, He gives us to set us apart. And some of us sometimes slip up. We get to be, uh, get to having a little more of a casual, relaxed, take it for granted attitude with God's Sabbath uh, than what He would want. We need to be deeply conscious of it, not to become negligent, not to, uh, become caught up in, uh, certain things, but we need to be very deeply conscious of properly observing God's Sabbath day and understanding what it means to observe the Sabbath. It doesn't mean, you know, maybe what the, the worldly churches think it means to observe Sunday. It means to remember the Sabbath. It means to keep it holy. It means to refrain from work on it, from refrain from doing your own thing. And if we do that, brethren, if we do keep the Sabbath, then we are keeping a sign that identifies us as God's true people. And we're utilizing time that gives us an opportunity to draw closer to the very creator of the universe who gives us every breath of air that we breathe.